markets are going to find the way. Markets are going to find the way. That's that. That was yeah. the smart program. money will find a way. Dumb money will find bags. Uh, yeah. They'll go to the mall and find bags, uh, but smart money will just not listen and get caught up in the bullshit. Oktoberfest is back this October 20th to 22nd with an intimate event for executives, influencers, and the most active investors in financial markets. Network with industry thought leaders, including Michael Batnick, Brian Shannon, Michael Parekh, and many more during the two-day event. Early bird pricing is still available for a limited time, so be sure to find the link in the episode description, and we'll see you in beautiful Coronado, California. Welcome, everybody. Trends with friends. Uh, we lost somebody. Phil's uh, Phil disappeared, slacking. So this uh, we have no moderator. So we're going to rely heavily today on now uh, a regular guest, Michael Parekh, and of course uh, JC. JC with the salmon colored shirt. Is there? Is this uh, what brought this on? It's summer. You know, I got a nice tan going. Uh, you know, I live in the Northeast, so I don't always have <laughs> no, a tan. I might be Cuban and everything, but I got to get some sun sometimes. So, you know, you got to you got to rock it when you got it right. You know, Mr. Parekh and Howard got better tans than me all year round. So I got a little sunburn. I've, I've got a little bit of a cycling burn uh, for the first time ever. I've ridden without sleeves, but I'm very excited about Tour de France. Um, it's already been I mean, the, the the three days in and they've already done like uh, this seven eight hundred kilometers, uh, which is just mind bending. The first day of Tour de France, JC, is the like context matters with for with everything here, and I I, I ride a lot, and I'm at and, and and Lance also has a show that he does with George Hincapie, which is a little too technical for me, but like I learn little tidbits. Um, because they, I've been on a lot of these rides as they do as an older person. Anyways, the first the first stage was 200 kilometers and 12,000 feet of climbing. I can't so even just, comprehend just what that context. means. Like that's like how, how much you can't. And I ride. Okay, okay. So so 12,000 feet. I'll give you some comprehension. I ride a lot, and for me, a max day, a max day, like endless training and like work. And I granted, I'm 58. Is a 6,000 foot. Like an epic, hardest day that I've ever been on, ever in my life, is six thousand feet of climbing, and about forty miles. Because you know you're grinding up, so you're not doing a lot of miles. They are doing a hot. So their first day of the tour was double the amount of climbing I've ever done. Okay, of twenty one days, and they'd covered a hundred and thirty miles. So. This is why that is the best event. Let them drug. Let them do whatever. Uh, let them do it's drugs. Just survival. Like you're, you're, just, like the, just screw it. Just let them do drugs. They are doing. Well, here's the thing. They're doing it. Like they're not doing drugs to be 600 pounds and to be linemen. Everything that they're doing is on the inside for some reason, right? It's obviously about recovery, muscle recovery, and and their butt, and getting their muscles to recover from from doing that for 21 days and obviously it's about boosting their heart rate and yada 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 um but they all look the same it's not like you go in and all of a sudden there's a guy that's 240 doing these rides you know they all have to be between 140 160 pounds i think uh maybe lance was a little heavier so um it's fascinating like even on a car it's just some people when they go do some of these things, they go do some of the rides that I've done, and they they say they Tom rode it in a car once. One of my rides, he goes, I, I don't understand. So hats off, I think it's the the best event in the world that these guys. It's you know the most interesting, and I, I urge anybody to, that's somewhat interested in in what goes on to watch a Netflix show. Okay, uh, let's get right into. We've got Michael here. We're going to talk about tech, but let's get right into the market here. You had a great call on Tesla, JC. Let's 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 go right into what's happening. Me and Mike were like a little bit skeptical. Uh, JC's for about three weeks. You've had this Tesla trade on, and today it's really jihading. What uh, it started out as it started out as a put selling trade, but it has now just become uh, uh, a really good bounce. I mean, listen, it. it, it it's one of those situations where, you know, uh, 
it, it happens where you like a stock, but there's also a very well-defined level that you could sell puts against. So you could either use that level as a stop, you could sell puts against it, you could do both like we did, right? Like the, it doesn't always ha happen that way, but in this case it did. You had a very clear level, 165, you sell those puts all day. And I remember asking, cause there are certain stocks that you just don't sell naked puts on. Like it's just not worth the risk. And I remember asking the fellas, you know, Sean, uh, Straza, Alfonso be like, is Tesla in the category of don't sell puts, you know? And we all agreed that it was not, right? Like Elon could be as crazy as he is, but it was not on the list of don't sell puts. So we sold the puts. Obviously that worked out very well. I think I hit our profit target like in a couple of days. That was just a luck of time. But at the end of the day, I think it's a top down perspective that I think really helps with this one and helped initiate those longs. Because if we're in a bull market, Consumer discretionary has been underperforming for so long, right? It's just been a complete disaster um, for quite some time now. Amazon hasn't done anything for four years, et cetera, et cetera. So if this is a bull market, you're going to get rotation into consumer discretionaries. Discretionaries aren't just going to complete a massive top and start to crash. So if you want to buy weakness in bull markets, that's where buy the fucking dip comes from, right? Like buy, That's what this is, is buy consumer discretionary. Okay, great. Now, does it make sense to buy consumer discretionary? Well, 25% of the index is Amazon, and it's breaking out of a four-year base. So what's the second largest component? It's Tesla. 14 15% of the entire discretionary index is Tesla. So using that top-down perspective of rotation, and then Tesla just happens to also provide a very well-defined out, very key support that is either going to hold or it's going to not or not, the weight of the evidence suggests that it's going to hold. You buy the stock, you sell the puts, right? And it's a ripper. Now, okay, that already happened, obviously. So now what? Here's now what. In these sorts of situations, you're getting a massive unwind. And what ends up happening is that you don't just revert to the mean. You revert beyond the mean. And therefore, getting back to those former all-time highs, I don't want to say is a done deal, but in my opinion, I think there's a very high likelihood that we get back to those all-time highs. And if we do, there's a huge chance that we break right out of that and head to 1,000. Because I think everybody's forgetting, because it's, it's been long enough. The stock went from $30 billion in market cap to almost $1.3 in a couple of years. So the fact that it's consolidated and digested those gains for a few years very well deserved but this is a big deal and i think it's taken long enough for people to forget that it was just a good call i have nothing to add there i mean you you define the risk that's why i wanted to revisit it um let's get into the market here jc we usually end with this but let's just get right into it, you me and mike because mike's Mike's yeah, and Mike, I want to I hear your perspective here. on all this, and we can circle back to this whole discretionary trade because that's what this is, right? Tesla is the second largest component. So here's Amazon. Here's Amazon, right? So Amazon's breaking out to all-time highs. It's 25%, 24% of the entire consumer discretionary index. You can see it breaking out of this massive base. We are now exceeding the prior cycle's highs. So now the largest component in one of the most important sectors in the United States, arguably the entire world, consumer discretionary, is breaking out of a four-year base to new all-time highs. So now, this is near and dear to Howard's heart because you and I have spoken about these companies for years. Um, these, there are Amazons in other countries, right, Howard? You've got the, uh, you've got Mercado Libre, in, which is Argentina, and that's all Latin America. You've got Junmaya, which is in Africa. You've got like Alibaba in China. You've got Caspi in Kazakhstan. C Limited, S-E. Like that is like, a, you know, a, a, all traders know C Limited, right? I mean, these are all the Amazons of the various countries. I actually own that. But I would say PDD is the new Alibaba. Again, not, not that I'm a China expert. Yeah. Um, but um, much harder to because of currency and other things to to own these amazon is still the way to play this but that's a good list yeah the the um are they doing well i own a little coupang but it hasn't really done anything well if you scroll down i brought in a chart of coupang because it's actually doing better than c limited right so c limited is back to that those former highs from 2022 and stuck below it c limited is also below its anchored vwap from its all-time highs 
Kupang is above both of those. So Kupang is above all that resistance from 22, and it's above the anchored VWAP from the all-time high. So the, the average participant is now making money, and by definition, in uptrends, those who own it are being rewarded, right? In, in uptrends, in bull markets, the, the people that own those things are being rewarded, right? We know that. So if we reverse engineer it, we want to be looking for stocks where the owners are being rewarded. Coupang is now one of those. Not all of these Amazons of other countries are like that. If you scroll up, Mercado Libre, you know, that's, you know, one of the more popular ones. Obviously, such a huge company. Linzen talks about it all the time. Did you take that public, Mike, at Goldman? Mike, did you Which take one? that public at Goldman? Mercado Libre? I know Fred was Fred Wilson was the original investor back in fucking the nineties. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I don't think we, JC you uh, knew that. Yeah. You didn't do uh, that IPO? We were involved in that, but I, I don't think we took that one out. I had to re- okay. go back. Um, I mean, that's but, some history, man. That was like a nineteen ninety eight probably IPO, ninety-nine. I like the Kazakhstan and, um, one, Howard. The one from Kazakhstan. <laughs> Throw that one up. I couldn't find it on a map. This is Caspi. Where, where Throw is up it? Caspi. Um, so that's the one that I like. Um, big base. This is a new issue. Um, I challenge Riley to go uh, look at the data on stock twits. I imagine it's going to be very little. Uh, a lot of that has to do, obviously, because it's in Kazakhstan, but also because this is a new issue. This thing just went public a few months ago. So if we can get above those highs and we can stick that landing, that's a huge base. Relative strength. This is, and it's not just like the Amazon. It's like a Kazakhstani fintech. Hmm. Never heard of it, but uh, congrats on, on finding that. Um, the other side of the Amazon trade is Nike, uh, Lulu, which you got bearish on Lulu a few months back, but Nike, Lulu, Starbucks, because they're consumer too. And I think it has a lot to do with Amazon because when you go to Amazon, you see Nike products next to Onan products next to whatever brand and i think you're really starting to see the effects you know um where for a while amazon was supposed to destroy procter and gamble but really what it's destroying is the actual you know lugged more uh upscale consumer brands procter and gamble is doing as as well as ever because supermarkets haven't gone away and um it seems like the brands like nike are the ones in Lulu that are suffering because your products get shown next to other products. And with Lulu, it's Voari, Aloe, and a thousand other uh, brands that could be, they could be the ones being affected, you know? So here's a long-term chart of Lulu. I thought you'd appreciate this one, Howard. One of Howard's favorite books, right? Shoe Dog. Howard loves Shoe Dog. I read Shoe Dog because Howard told me to. It's a good book. The book could be great and the stock can be shit. Like there was a period where I think he he wrote that as kind of a Bible for the team, not to get too political and kind of gave him a roadmap of what the brand stood for. But maybe tech is just coming for the law of large numbers. I'm not sure. It's still a $100 billion company selling shoes. So I don't know, Mike, any any thoughts there as it relates to Amazon and, and the consumer goods? Yeah, the consumer goods. The one thing I'll just highlight on uh, on a bottom of a uh, fundamentals point of view on Amazon, the thing that caught my eye this uh, this week was Amazon is looking like it's going to borrow big time a couple of pages from both Temu and she. And since we're talking about Asian and Chinese uh, consumer retail, et cetera, they're going to take advantage of that $800 uh, loop, loophole from a shipping point of view that Temu and she and basically, you know, uh, cracked a big dent into the targets and the Kohl's uh, uh, and the Walmarts of the, of the, in the U.S. You know, my sister, uh, probably she, she, by own admission, anecdotally, spends uh, as much on Tim Wu and she and as she used to on, on any of the stores where she, she would have to go in. So Amazon is going after that. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important uh, element because they, they're going to try and build this value shopping tier for mainstream shoppers in the U.S., they're seeing that they're having their lunch eaten a little bit by the uh, Asian uh, Chinese retail companies, and they're they're going to react to that. So that's uh, that's. So you're saying an American yeah, women are what, using Chinese apps, and it's cheaper it's for them to order those things in the U.S. A, in the last two years, this has been a fundamental. You, I can send you research on this um, uh, because the analysts are different on the sell side and the buy side. You know, internet for uh, 
things like Timu and Shein and so on. And then the retail analysts are looking at this from a bricks and mortar target calls. The dots have not yet been connected, but I've done a lot of work looking at uh, the cross fertilization. Yes, um, Temu and Shein have made huge inroads, huge inroads, very meaningful mainstream real inroads where tens of millions of American uh, shoppers, a uh, lot, lot of women, are shopping on those sites. Uh, uh, those, those companies have figured out how to use machine learning dramatically to reverse engineer manufacturing. So if, you, if people like your red sweatshirt, uh, they can quickly figure out uh, that people are looking at it just like TikTok, et cetera, and then reverse uh, order 100,000, 200,000 orders directly from factories in China and then ship them. Under $800, there's a big loophole. And Congress, of course, is looking at it you know, because it gives Chinese companies an advantage. But for the last few years, this has been if, if it can be shipped directly to you under $800, there's, there's, uh, there's meaningful tax savings. So, so, for instance, my sister is finding that she's getting 40, 50, 60, 70% off on a lot of things. Uh, you know, just daily, uh, uh, it used to be clothing and now it's everything between Temu and Shein. So it's a big chunk of consumer uh, consumption in the United States. And under our radar, the Chinese companies have absolutely been making, just like TikTok took a huge chunk of our attention, um, Shemu and, 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 um, and uh, Shein have taken a huge chunk of our consumer mainstream spend. And well, that Amazon. has to be affecting right. Nike. So that has, but at the same time, JC, it's not like the consumers at Walmart, what Costco, Amazon, pretty much all time high. Dick's Sporting so it's Goods, like, new all time highs, absolutely crushing Dick's it. A bunch Sporting of insider goods. buying in Dick's Sporting Goods up here. You know, you don't see that as somebody who literally we do the That's insider crazy. filing data we aggregated better than anybody on the planet i'm telling you right now we don't see that <laughs> i mean what the hell yeah, does this guy has been a home run too yeah. so it's selective the the i think it's another huge blunder by the u.s where china has different we can't play by the same rules in china right like we're seeing it play out in europe mike like europe is now anti-us it's not the right way to be like europe's Europe's going to hurt its own consumers by blocking Google and, and uh, the GBTR, or whatever you call it. It's a nightmare as someone you know running stock twits to see what GDPR has done. Um, so, for, and I, I have a whole for topic trust. on that. I had a whole thing to talk talk about later on the on the regulatory front in terms of uh, yeah, the uh, between what's going on in Europe uh, and then some of the things that are going on in the U.S. Uh, these are big political regulatory headwinds. You know, the, in the U.S., it's all the antitrust stuff against against all the big tech fighting yesterday's wars. In Europe, it's literally going after Apple and Microsoft and Meta you know, yesterday. Uh, and literally, uh, depends on the company. Apple, for instance, I think it's less than 8% of their revenues. I mean, if Apple decided tomorrow, hey, guys, we're, we're just not going to play in Europe, you know, it's not going to be that much of a hit for them. I mean, generally speaking, it's not a good thing. I, I, I'm a big believer in globalization and and as equal markets, because that's how everyone benefits. It you know the tide lifts all boats. But for a whole bunch of political reasons, this is what's going on in terms of Europe literally uh, getting ahead of their skis. I think in terms of trying to protect the users, and and, and you already see it. Apple, you know, played a little bit of the heavy you know stick card, saying, "Hey, we have, we we may not bring Apple intelligence on our devices to Europe. It actually doesn't hurt that much." But it's a signal saying, hey, we won't bring our latest toys to you because you're re you know, making it difficult, uh, actually impossible, to actually deliver the benefits of that technology to your users because of the way you're mandating the rules, if you go into the we uh, weeds of it. And so, so the broad, broad, broad picture of this is that I've been worried over the last couple of years that the internet was and, and AI, internet, everything was getting balkanized into two big chunks, China and the rest of the world. Now, over the next two years, I'm now getting starting to get worried about three blocks, three balkanizations. Uh, China having their own, you know, top to bottom tech stack. They're making their own chips, etc. And and you know their their own world. Europe 
uh, which is being left behind if they continue on this trend. And th there are separate rules, separate products and services from Apple and Meta and uh, Microsoft and Google and everybody. They're not necessarily going to get all the benefits of all the latest things from these companies, which is which are the fountain of this innovation right now, because it's all we're in a mainframe AI cycle. But it's you, the big companies have the ability to deliver mass amounts of compute driven AI services. And it doesn't exist in Europe right now. So they're, 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 that's a risk for them. So three, three balkanizations. So that's a, that's a, that's a second point. And then the uh, coming back to the consumer discussion, which was with JC and you guys are talking about, again, this, this $800 loophole was not built for or against the Chinese. It was just a thing there for a long time. And <laughs> the Chinese entrepreneurs are amongst the most amazing entrepreneurs on a bottom-up basis that we've seen in the last 15, 20 years. They, they, if you just look at how they compete against each other in the world, they find a way. That's why I, I come up, came up with this Jurassic Park. They find a, they've always found a way, and and so yes, I loved it that Amazon is now reacting to the Shun Shemu, uh, uh, the sorry Shemu Xian loophole, and and uh, uh, I mean the, their advantage, not that it's not their loophole, but it's that they're going to take advantage of their ability to source things around the world, use the reverse engineering sourcing. Um, ecosystem that the that the Temu and Shein have built and deliver huge amounts of value to to their core US market. Then that's a that's a that's a plus. So it's a, it's a proof that even at, at at these big size or whatever everybody said America, these companies are too big, they have they're being forced to innovate. Amazon they are in the stock the stock was yeah. you know when I watch these companies our this time versus how I used to watch them uh, in my professional capacity, when uh, when it was the internet and PC, these companies have the opportunity to innovate across probably five or ten times the industries that they that they did in the past, and they're doing it. You know, I mean, our last call I talked about how Amazon uh, invested billions into one medical to deliver medical services. Um, uh, you know, all of these companies have built huge amounts of um, uh, media streaming. Infrastructure, Apple, uh, TV Plus, uh, Amazon Prime, etc. I mean, these companies are innovating, and and my only thing is, uh, my only two cents to the companies and the boards would be, for, forget about the regulators. Yes, you have to deal with the regulators, but one jujitsu move possible for the big tech companies in the next three years is to self spin out, do controlled carve outs of their core properties, make them keep, keep 30, 40% of them spin out 40, 40, 50%. You can, you can, you, you know, AWS could be spun out. Oracle cloud could be spun out in a half of it. And investors in this market where investors around the world are hungry for growth and hungry to invest will, will, you will have a stock to track, you know, just like, I mean, JC put up Caspi from Kazakhstan, a $26 billion entity. I mean, yeah. By the we way, pays a six percent six percent dividend but yield. But what's yep. their so Mike, we've talked about this forever. What's their incentive? Because everybody said they should spin off. So this goes to so many discussions, Mike, that you bring up because Correct. this goes to pre this goes to the breadth discussion. If if Apple Watch yep. is a Ford, like you said last time, is a Fortune yep. one hundred company. But what's the incentive for Apple to finally do this? Because that company Because the incentives then, is what's gonna drive this. Incentives yes, is what's gonna drive this. That spun out company can now go ahead and offer a lot of additional integration services to everybody else. The, one of the magic uh, elements of AWS was, if, if you look at back over the last 20 years for Amazon, Jeff Bezos said, hey, we're going to need all this compute to build all our services for e-commerce. Why don't we sell some of it? And that's what you know AWS went and ran with. And guess what? <laughs> it's become a huge business in its own right, biggest cloud provider out there. Why? Because AWS was not just providing services to Amazon, which if it was only allowed to sell to Amazon, it would have been a far smaller business. But, you know, they expanded into a TAM that was extraordinarily bigger, uh, and we could find the same thing for, uh, you know, if Apple sp as, as spun out Apple Watch or Google spun out Google Cloud, uh, the commercial part of it, uh, as but an example. But what's in it? Thing, so some of 
So, so maybe what's in it then is that Elon kind of showed the way, even though he didn't do it for the same reasons that Apple should do it or Google should do it by have, by running six companies. Maybe Tim Cook could still be GM or CEO of six different Apple companies, but have their own separate management teams. And is that a way? So is the government indirectly going to create this by by not allowing acquisitions? So maybe what drives this is the fact that if Amazon can't make an acquisition as Amazon one company, if Amazon split into six companies, they could become an acquisition machine. So I think exactly. you know that goes to people finding a way. Jurassic Park of and that could be a hidden unlock in in a bull run here. The question is. That may be the only way to get IPOs is to spend is to not break up these companies, which everybody was trying to do, but Apple, Google break themselves up for growth. So it could be, and they could be following Elon's model. Where listen, he's got the he's got SpaceX, which is a two hundred billion dollar private company, and can make fun of him all he want, but he he actually has proved it out. He's got. Um, Mike, I got a, I, I got a question. He's got. You- He's got Can Tesla. Can you school us a little bit on the spinoffs? Um, you know, you you have a little more experience than me in terms of being a market participant, particularly on that side of the business. I remember early in my career, there were a lot more spinoff situations, and there were a lot more stories about spinoffs. You know, I could think of like the Three Com and Palm situation was like a shit show. Correct. You know, one of my all time favorites. Uh, can you can you share some color on on? The, the lack of spinoffs is what it seems like these days versus what it was back in the day, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, spinoffs, you're totally right, JC. They've been around for a long time as a market instrument, et cetera. In my, uh, in my 20 years, I spent a lot of time, you know, we, we helped uh, Barnes & Noble build BarnesandNoble.com and figure that out and then spun it out as a separate thing and so on, Co- you know, Compiscovery. So spinoffs have been there for, you know, as long as stock markets have been there. Though it's different this time, is that we have four or five major U.S. companies that are each over a trillion dollars, and you know it's like what you guys were talking about: law of large numbers. You know the uh, the, the 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 market will buy these things and put them in indexes and so on, and and they will look at one or two of the of the businesses of those companies, but the number three, four, five, six companies that all uh, sub units of those companies have. Opportunities that are each maybe a trillion dollars on their own right, but they won't get there because there is not enough buy side attention, information, analysis, the ability for those companies to compete for a broader piece of that market because they are not captive in that thing. All of that stuff comes to play. In other words, the history of spinoffs teaches us that at scale, these things can be even more powerful. Uh, than has ever been, but we've never had the opportunity to try it because we never had trillion dollar companies. We never had companies with five to ten businesses within within the within the same company that was as big. Yes, we, in the in the sixties we used to have conglomerates, you know, Gulf and Western and so on. That were there was a whole conglomerate, you know. And then, so then, hold on, you know, so my what, whole, what are some bond. of the examples so, like AWS or YouTube, like stuff like that? No, but I think I think what the other thing that we're missing here, and I'll go right back to Mike, is because of indexing, it wouldn't be like they'd have to market five different companies. So if Amazon woke up tomorrow and said we're five companies, they'd all still be held. It exactly. wouldn't change the share structure because yes, there'd be different eyes on them, but all five of those Amazon companies would already be in your Vanguard S and P five hundred fund. Correct. So it wouldn't Correct. change. It wouldn't be like they're taking a hit in shareholder base. Correct. No, and, and 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 Amazon could still own 30, right. 40, 50%. The percent. They could have <laughs> incentives of the thing. You know, they could still have the control. They can have their cake and eat it right. too. Those are structuring things. That what's that's what investment banks, that's what the kind of thing I used to help with, you know, as a partner in Goldman Sachs. I mean, that's what that it, but it's just that now we would think about it in a bigger scale. You know, you know, we're talking about eight and nine digit numbers on the companies. Um, you know, so Google, YouTube, as an example, an obvious one. I'm just going to throw out Amazon. It's Amazon Prime. I mean, Amazon Prime by itself is 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 a Costco. I mean, just think about it. Just think about Costco. Look at Costco against you know Walmart, etc. You look at you look at the same thing with with Microsoft in terms of their enterprise business and their 
and their uh, and their Azure cloud business, which has been the big driver. I'm not saying everyone should be doing it, but we are at a point where the regulatory headwinds from Europe, from the China issue, from is uh, from the US are suppressing the natural opportunities for growth of a lot of the businesses within these companies. And one of these days, the light is going to go off both on the company side and the investor side that this kind of makes sense. Somebody will try it. What's holding them back? Somebody will try it. I would, I, would, I would say this is being priced in as we speak. If you look at like Piper Sandler's stock or any of the investment bank stocks like Goldman Sachs, remember we talked about why I'm long Goldman, Goldman, Gold, Google. Well, maybe underlying this is happening, Mike. I mean, you're probably not caught up. But maybe this is being priced into the fact that if this happens, Goldman's going to crush it because who else could manage this process but Goldman? And the stock's are already at all-time highs. If Amazon announced this tomorrow, Goldman would go up 10 15% because this is endless banking money for the next three years multiplied by 100 companies, which reminds me, we'll, we'll end with India because India is probably the fourth. It's not just Europe with respect to public markets it's not just europe china europe's going the other way but you know europe these these europe china us i think on the free spirited way it's india right like they're benefiting from all the quagmire everywhere else because they have a big enough market on their own and they're so uh young in terms of of growth and, and opportunity and and so while everybody's bickering india is just continuing to rock and um, by the way india and, had a very it, you know, the people don't think about it in the context of the market side, but, you know, as a, as a general optimist, the elections in India, which was one of the other big elections this year, uh, you know, billion four people are going to, and, and, and the Modi government not getting as much of the um, uh, parliamentary vote as they thought, and with the opposition getting more of a play, is a good thing for, for, invest, for foreign investors, foreign capital, etc., because it, it puts a little bit of, of the brakes for the government to do some of the populist things, et cetera, that they want, want to do on, on, the, uh, on the minority side of the equation. And it's a, it, it, it improves the environment for Apple, for Amazon, for Google, for any U.S. company, for not just tech, to invest more aggressively in India. And India is it. I mean, it is the one country with the biggest... Um, um, uh, demographic dividend in terms of, you know, they, they've got a surplus, 30, 40 uh, percent of young people who, who are looking for jobs, who are looking for opportunities. And they, they, they need to uh, um, see capital come, come in with confidence beyond the, the small group of crony um, capitalist com companies in India who take most of that, of the, just most of that um, opportunity. And, I, and so I'm, I'm I'm getting a little bit more optimistic on India, but it's early. The elections just happened. But yes, I agree with you on the India piece. So it, it, it's very early, but JC, let's go to it. Like I'm noticed. Let's let's throw it up. We'll end India with is this. one of my favorite yeah. places in the entire world. Mumbai has been such a special place for me. So I try not to let that like impact my you know market stuff, right? You know what I mean? Like I love Japan too, but it doesn't mean right. So I try to kind of keep these thing, two things separate. But I mean, listen, it's hard to. Um, hard to fight this. I mean, look at the Nifty 50 and Nifty 500 just in June. I mean, as somebody who looks at as many candlesticks as I do every day for so many years, to see uh, what the Nifty 50 and Nifty 500 did in the month of June, they knocked them down early. I know the election, something had to do with that. But either way, regardless of the reason, the reversal that we've seen to go out at new all-time highs, going out at the highs for the month, very, very impressive in India. And I brought together, uh, and by the way, India's market cap, total market cap of all the stocks in the country are, are getting approaching Japan. Uh, so not too far away from exceeding Japan in total value. Um, I, I don't want to say that's a guarantee, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm willing to bet that India is a larger stock market than Japan very soon uh india uh over which makes sense so so i will share a quote uh a data they've had more than one ipo a year so how many days so there's been 100 there's been 200 days this year and they've done close to 220 ipos i don't know what the ipo is in the u.s but it ain't 
It ain't 200 no, IPOs. No, it's a US, lot less. It's probably 20. It's probably 20. And these are small market caps, but there are big companies. Michael was talking about them before that trade here in the United States. Like, let's go over a few. First of all, here's ICICI Bank, which is a name we talk about all the time. Of course, my fundamental friends. Michael, I'd love for you to speak on this. My fundamental friends, and you could go to the Bank Nifty, which is next. That's the uh, financials index in India, Bank Nifty, and also making new all-time highs. From my fundamental friends, they tell me that the Indian banks are the ones that trade at the highest multiples. These are the most expensive banks in the world, I guess for good reason. You get what you pay for, huh, Michael? India is, uh, you know, we talk about the underbank market in the U.S. India is massively underbanked. They are leapfrogging, you know, their, their payment structure has, has leapfrogged uh, uh, what we've done. They've emulated what was happening in China. And Indian banks uh, have also had a little bit of uh, a disadvantage over the last 10, 15 years, is that because labor was so cheap, they were slower, both the public sector, state banks, and the private banks in automation. And that is changing around rapidly over the last uh, two or three, four years. So yes, they, they have a, an opportunity. I mean, we, we went through automated tellers and all of that uh, efficiency curve in banks in the US you know, 30, 40 years ago. The Indian banks are just starting to see some of that um, oomph as well. So um, they're, they're coming on fast in terms of the innovation of technology and services and, and leveraging technology, and, and all of that is ahead of them. So that would be my two cents just for on, perspective, the, on, on, on the- for perspective, look at that chart yeah. and look at that peak in the great financial crisis there in 2007, and look where the yeah. financials index in India, the Bank Nifty, is now. It is up- Wow. Sixfold? Yes. So, six so the U.S. is just getting back to all-time right. highs, and they're up sixfold. It's kind of like relative strength, baby. The question is, for the average, This I'm not saying it's early or late. Um, I think it's early at some stuff, and maybe this stuff's over just too expensive. It's risky, but that's what relative strength is, right? Like if people, for young people listening, it, it, your investing career is going to be very long. Like Mike and I and, and you, JC. These type of things are going to happen over the course of the next 30 years, no matter what the government does, no matter what the policy, it may not happen in the US, it may not happen in Europe, but this is going to happen somewhere. That's the beautiful thing that Web2 and Robinhood's Coinbase is all this shit brought along is the fact that you have the ability to go look here. So relative strength played a huge role here. Goldman Sachs is just hitting all time highs. Um, the U.S. financials they, index is in just, just broke out above, you know, those former uh, great Correct. financial crisis highs. So let's go over a few Indian companies because, you know, for a lot of investors, they might not know sure. how easy it is to, you know, buy things in India. First of all, well, I brought up, I brought up, make my trip at forty. That was a, an idea that I shared because relative strength wise, it was the first Indian stock to me. Yeah, so you can see it hasn't looked back since I, I brought it up at forty. It's a, it's a double. I think the company is still very small. Um, would I change? Yeah, still very small company. And if you think about the U.S. air trap, U.S. airport traffic is at an all-time high. Does that mean you can go buy Delta Airlines or Southwest? No. I mean, go do your own work. No, the Indian airline market is very, very, very uh, robust. A lot of competition. There's been uh, ups and downs, just like a lot of uh, airline, airlines, private airlines got out. Same thing happened in India, but air travel is crazy booming. I was just there a month or two ago. Everyone, mainstream people are flying, uh, like everywhere, and 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 the government is spending massive, massive amounts on airports uh, around the country, uh, not just top tier, but mid, second and third, fourth tier airports. So yeah, yeah. I would. Uh, so so like, what you do board. here, people, is you do some homework. I haven't done it for you today, but Riley has, but. There's probably three or four budding make my trips in the travel space that are breaking out, show relative strength, yada, yada, yada. Um, Booking.com in the US looks better than most travel stocks, but it's got the law of large numbers behind, you know, on its, which is more of a problem, right? How big can you get versus make my trip, which has the whole world to expand into, and it's just a $10 billion company. And then go to the healthcare so stock. You can see we're relative strength. Go to the healthcare stock because it's a go similar ahead. situation, similar size company, Dr. Reddy's. Um, this is RDY's, a drug manufacturer, about $12 billion, showing relative strength, like you said, Howard, but not like overextended. This is building a really nice- It's an base. Indian company? I'm sorry? 
this an Indian company? Yeah, this is a this drug manufacturer in India. A twelve billion dollar market cap. Trades right here in the United States. Doctor Reddy's. What do they make? Do they got a uh, penis pill? Do they have a fat pill? Because if they get a fat pill, you can ask. I don't know. It's a drug manufacturer. That's above I'm my pay grade. Go I see more. mine go yeah, up. India, India in general is uh, is with one of the biggest uh, generic pharmaceutical uh, uh, industries uh, providing the world. So it's a it's a big big opportunity and and regulatory wise in the US uh it, it, uh, we've not had the opportunity to avail ourselves of um drugs uh, pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals from places like India that has been opening up a little bit it started would be uh, Canada and so on but that is opening up Mark Cuban uh if you look at you know his uh, uh cost plus model etc they're trying to take advantage of of um of uh, manufacturers from overseas and 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 build that into the system. Well, I just bought a few shares already because that's that that's uh, wow. That is a great looking base, JC. India, man. That I mean, is, listen. You uh, want to go where the relative JC, strength uh, is? This is this is Linzen. This is uh, Linzen, like you know, to its most. That's extreme. a that's a Linzen stock. Like relative strength country. Yeah. yeah. Relative strength <laughs> stock, right? Like making new highs under power. Relative strength sector. Relative strength sector too. Yeah, sure. No, what um, I like about this is that these are also trade. You said JC, JC in the U.S. Of right? So you, these are yeah. you're not you're not buying on the look. No, these are ADRs. Um, these are I, big. Yeah. Eight, twelve. This is twelve yeah, million it's dollars. It's, yeah, it's big. Right. Yeah. So interesting idea there, but yeah, India looks to be, and then you know, throw in degenerates. There's not there's not a bigger nation of degenerates, even though it's small numbers. You know, if you look at Robinhood, Coinbase, crypto, India loves. You know this, JC, because that's why you went there. They love trading. They love speculation. So you're talking about a times 10 degenerate uh, market opportunity there, which I don't know who's the big benefit benefactor of that yet. But I know in the private markets that there's 20 Robin Hoods that have been funded in India. So I do know that I've avoided that market. Uh, alpaca is kind of our play there. And I see it from our investment in alpaca, how many with the stakes are very high in both the Arab countries um, and in India for winning brokerage and for winning wallets. The wallet sizes are smaller. They're less distributed. You know, it's a very has, has not much like the Arab uh, uh, economies, but um, the stakes are very high for some winners there in the, in the degenerate economy. And that goes to, you know, probably they've already had um, gambling around their sport, uh, I'm having a brain fart, not rug. Um, no, one one of the biggest hits in India from a sports uh, talking about the degenerate economy has been the uh, cricket side, obviously. Cricket, sorry, where, you know, cricket. They, yeah. they, it's, it's I think the third or fourth la um, largest market for private teams uh, outside the NFL, NBA, uh, India is the is the um, uh, is is the big innovator in the last ten years. Uh, a lot of celebrities and 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 and. Uh, the billionaires, et cetera. They, they, it just like team ownership has been a big thing in the US and in, in Europe, et cetera. It's becoming and has become a relatively big thing in India. And cricket is the, you know, other than soccer, those, those are the two big sports around the world. By the way, I went to the cricket so, batting yeah. cages, like to, right, the, the equivalent of the cricket batting cages. Dude, I was hacking away, right? I thought I was the man. And then they start throwing the spinners because you could change who the pitcher is. And they're, or the, uh, it's not called the pitcher, it's um, the bowler. Right. So he's throwing. And then once they start doing the spinners, which is like the, the, the curveball of cricket, oh, this is impossible because it bounces. It's not like a baseball. It bounces. Sure. Dude, shit is no. impossible. No. So mad respect to these cricket guys. No, no. And by the way, speaking of India cricket, as, uh, it's a, a, the U.S. Indian American entrepreneurs are trying to bring it here. Satya Nadella and Sundar and all these other folks. They're, there's a big effort to build cricket in the u.s as they well. played a bunch just of queens just like soccer games. in queens a lot of indian so, guys um, out there playing all right so we've covered a lot of like what is going right actually even though the headlines as i keep saying over the last year headlines will get worse so we've got headlines getting worse opinions getting dumber um the presidency getting dumber the common knowledge game that we know biden you know we all know what everybody knew um yet the markets go up amazon's fighting off china and thinking big, the incentives may be for companies to break up, which really bullish that banks are benefiting India, make my trip, RDY, Tesla. We've covered a lot of 
But underneath is what should we be worried about would be a quick, I'll leave that, you know, I want to end with this because it's like we've been pretty bullish for good reasons that we've been right. Um, more so that you than me, JC, I'm, I'm generally cautious, but like optimistic. What are we missing based on what we've seen? I just, I Go, I'll start with you, Mike. Say, and then more, I, right? I, I just think very simply what most people think is the most important thing doesn't necessarily mean that the market thinks that that's the most important things. The market is factoring in so many different circumstances and events and, and evolutions all over the world in real time. So what somebody on their couch watching the news might think in their head, wow, this is the most important thing in the world right now and the market doesn't care. It's not that it doesn't care. It's that there's a lot of other things that the market cares about. In most cases, it cares a hell of a lot more than what you think is the most important thing going on in the whole world right now. So I just want to remind everybody that it's what the market thinks, not what we think, or Howard, or Michael, or, you know, the TV, or the radio. Like, the market's going to do what it wants to do, so we can either listen to the market or not. No, I, I, I agree. And then, I, I just said, since Howard, you brought up the common knowledge Ben Hunt post on, and if people haven't seen it, you should go to Howard's um, site and look at read that. That's a great piece. I've been a huge follower of that, uh, of, of Ben and just, uh, then the case he makes that, you know, the, when the emperor has no clothes and at some certain point people, people understand it, et cetera. Uh, and it's a very, very strong piece. The one thing I would add to it from an AI perspective, and I may write up something around these lines, is when you think about what AI does, which is suck in data of everything and then su summarize it probabilistically wise, it's the a AI in the next two or three years is the new raised base of common knowledge for the universe uh, that we we are going to summarize the truth um, uh, and it's not as gameable as traditional computer-based social media has been gameable why because it it gets sucked into today a handful of uh, of big llms in two years it's going to be hundreds of llms and in three to four years it's going to be Million, thousands and millions of LLMs. So it's not gameable. Uh, it's a far less gameable than news is today. And so the common knowledge for the people to figure out what the truth is, whether it's you know about a president or about uh, a specific uh, Nike shoe, uh, whatever it is, the common knowledge of that is, is going to be much more available than ever before. There's a very famous quote, and I've written a post about this, Isaac Newton, you know, when he got a big award, you know, uh, uh, he, he uh, for astronomy, he, he basically said, if I have seen father, is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants, Otsog, O-T-S-O-G. And the reason I'm bringing it up is, is for humanity, for two, three thousand years, we've built on the knowledge of other people to become better, to, to invent things, etc. Common knowledge that Ben Hunt talks about is, is Otsog at a massive a um, hundred x, thousand x basis, and so there is a. So that's another reason I come away more optimistic, despite all the bad news and the bad feeling about where we are going in the next five to ten years on a bottom up basis than than I ever have been for thirty years. Yes, there are a lot of things to worry about, a lot of things to you know pull our hair out about, but that common knowledge piece, Otsog is a very, very key piece. And I, I can I can underline that I've written about a lot about it. We can talk about it separately. I, I love that. I, I lo it's oh. a new term for me. So it's a new favorite term, Otsog. The the thing that I want, we're trying to teach younger people here and you know, for my kids or the people that really love this show is that you could get negative as you want. India doesn't give a fuck, right? Like you want to play the Europe game and drown yourself in misery and bad uh, policy Go invest in Europe. You want to, your money is free, right? Like, gee, our, our, our earned income is free to travel and find pockets of strength and relative strength. And I'm just mystified that people can't find more people like this. It's easy to take common knowledge and get depressed and go, fuck, we're just living in a world of con. Like, I call it peak grifting, right? When, if you, if you go into this assuming grift is everywhere, you're going to be a better investor. Right, because it's never been easier to grift. Therefore, grift you can drown yourself. Grift but now it's never been easier <laughs> to do it because you can do it at a global it's scale. Easier, 
It, it, it's you can create right supply home. off a phone. You can create supply. You don't have to go mine something to create Griff. You can no, no, just exactly. if you create it on your phone. If, if you want to feel good about Grifters and, and so on, go. I, I did it again. Uh, I rewatched this. The Music Man. Go watch The Music Man. You know, it's the Con Man Griff. Uh, it's That's it's an old. Funky. You're going old school there. Man. I'm going old school. I'm going old school. But I'm just saying, <laughs> look, I, you know, glass always full is my motto. And so look for the upside on this. Thing. Yes, I loved your phrase, uh, you know, a few days ago about grift of fatigue. Grift has always been there. It's just that we now as individuals, as countries, we have tools to, to see through the grift. And, and at some point, the common knowledge, the Otsog, I see on the shoulders of giants and grunts, the way I, write, I, I wrote about it, I'll send it around. It is, it is the thing that allows us to um, fundamentally move ahead of the grift. Uh, a little bit faster if we, if we, if we collectively we think about it. And that's why, JC, you know, you're showing the India charts and so on. You know, look, markets, as you're right, markets are going to find the way. Markets are going to find the way. That's, that, that was yeah. the... Smart purpose. money will find a way. Dumb money will find bags. Uh, yeah. uh, they'll go to the mall and find bags. Uh, but smart money will just not listen and get caught up in the bullshit. I will say in The Music Man, just how old I am, I was the lead and I can't play in The Music Man. I have to go look up the character. <laughs> this, this, so this, JC this, does not know. JC does, does not know what I'm talking about. We have to have a <laughs> there was no cameras. There was no camera back then. There was just some mosquitoes watching. You know. And by the way, I had a beautiful voice until my bar mitzvah when my voice changed. <laughs> All right. So, so we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we miss Phil. But, you. you know, fuck Phil. Phil's where is he? He's on vacation, JC. You think he's down in Costa Rica or something? I don't even know. He's good he's for doing, him. He's doing his thing. Good God bless him. him. Good for him. He's getting some sun. He's gonna. He's, he's you gonna told me like, yesterday. He's got older kids though. I got. I got infants. I can't go anywhere. So he's taking. You know, if I were him, I'd be doing the same thing. You're a slave to the show. Michael has no kids, so he's a slave to the show. I was slave. Uh, yeah. Next week I will be doing it, but I'll be at Wimbledon. Post Wimbledon quarterfinals, wow. so I'll report That's on that cool. first time ever, and then I'll be then I'll be at the finish line the following week at the Tour de France. So hopefully we'll have some friends. Amazing, uh, yeah. So uh, so gentlemen, a great great uh, show. Wonderful uh, to see you guys. Yeah, wonderful to see you. Thanks for putting this together, and uh, we'll see everybody next Adios. week. Thanks, Kiki. Thank you.